We had somebody in who definitely was a, as we call it in the UK, Jekyll and Hyde, absolutely charming, and then a real nightmare. They moved in, and within two weeks, because usually the trouble happens very quickly, all the other tenants were complaining about them, and it was quite clear that despite the fact we've got a six-month signed contract with this lad, nobody's enjoying this situation, so it has to change. <laughs> Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. Hello and welcome to episode 229. My guest today is one of the UK's most successful self-made property investors. She started her first business at the age of 22, and even then she knew that she had an entrepreneurial spirit which could not be constrained by a job. She broke out of the corporate world to follow her dreams and founded the Good Property Company UK, which she has been running for over 10 years. Susanna Cole, believes anyone can make millions from property and that it is possible to succeed even with very little money to start with. She has sourced, bought, or let out more than 200 properties with a value of 45 million pounds. And she has invested her own capital to develop her multi-million pound property portfolio. Susanna's top priority is helping others achieve or surpass her own success. Susanna, welcome to the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's nice to be waving at you guys from over the pond. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yes. Well, it's great to have you on the show. I, I'd love to know a little bit more about your background and just how you got started investing in real estate. Well, I think like many of us, I'm a little bit property obsessive. I mean, in, in I'm, I'm in Bristol in England and uh, an Englishman's castle is his home. So we, you know, as a culture, we love property in the UK. Um, so that was the first thing. I, I love the whole process. I love the deals. I love buying discounted. I, I did 45 million pounds worth of property that we sourced for 30 million quid. I love the whole creative process of it. I love making a tired or as we would call it, knackered old house into somewhere really wonderful that either somebody wants to buy or somebody wants to live in. But I also like the finance. I like the security. I like the passive income. And I always knew that as a little bit of a rebellious soul, as much as I could contribute to corporate life to a degree, I knew I was long term going to be unemployable because I'm a little bit too rebellious, a little bit too stubborn and don't really play the politics. Um, so, so I knew that self-employment was always the long-term route for me. So in, in my twenties, I ran a fair trade business and then went into corporate life. And I had four very interesting jobs, very, very interesting jobs, ran a radio station, was marketing director of a, a, a major museum, uh, was involved in a very fast growth startup for charity, but I always knew that self-employment and to me, property is logical. Logical because you can buy it with other people's money. You can buy it with the bank's money. It is an asset paying income and the income pays my bills. So it's not a service that you can't, well, it is a service, but it's not a service that you have to constantly run service provision. Your assets take the revenue in and your revenue pays your bills. Classic rich dad, poor dad. What was it? What was your first experience with rental property or owning rental property? Oh my goodness. It was terrifying. So my very, well, well, first off, if we could back up just one tiny sec, I was head of household, meaning it's a polite way of saying single parent. And therefore I wanted to be at home when the children were young. I had to work because I had to bring in money for my family. Uh, so I did an MBA and I had pretty decent jobs, you know, so good quality corporate jobs. But at nighttime, I didn't want to go out because my kids were at home. So after they were asleep, what do I do? I know that sounds a bit plaintive, but actually genuinely, I want to be at home because I love being a mum. Therefore, what do I do when they're asleep? Well, <laughs> renovate property. So I started actually, if we backtrack from my first rental, by buying four, one after the other, family homes. They're all do-uppers. Uh, and at nighttime, when the kids were asleep, <laughs> I would just roll my sleeves up and start doing the houses up. So actually, that gave me the first taste. Every single house I sold again within two and a half to three years. And every single house, I pretty much doubled the money. 
And that allowed me to build, 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 build. Do you see what I mean? And then I dropped down to Bristol and I was like, okay, I've got a little bit of room in my mortgage now. It's still a bit scary, but I feel like I can take a little bit of money out of this mortgage in order to go and buy my first rental property. So I kind of did the whole ladder thing first, renovating houses at night myself when the kids were asleep. You know, uh, you know where you kind of peeling wallpaper and, and underneath your nails it gets stuck and it hurts, that mm -hmm. stuff? Yeah, so that's like probably most of us. And then I bought a tiny one bed apartment, tiny. <laughs> and it's terrifying. And I bought it for 78,000 pounds. So I'll, I'll, if you translate, I'll talk in English pounds. Um, I bought it for £78,000. I spent just under £8,000 renovating it, just making it nicer. And I rented it for two or three years. Then I sold it for £120,000. And that wasn't because of price growth. That was just because I bought it discounted. So I was terrified before I bought it. Even though I knew I was buying it discounted. Uh, I went in on the day I bought it, still a bit scared, a bit terrified, went round the bedroom, the bathroom, the hallway and the kitchen diner, because that was it. It was small. That took 30 seconds. Then I was like, come on, let's go again. Let's do it again. So it sounds very similar to how a lot of people do it here in the United States. I'm wondering what the differences might be. I mean, here in the United States, not only can you benefit from the cash flow, but there's yeah. also tax benefits like depreciation that you get. What, what's it like there in, in England? So we don't have that. We might, I might be like a little bit envious of you over there. So um, we, have, we benefit from rental income. We benefit from a great banking opportunity where they're going to lend us up to, well, actually, I think it's a little bit crazy, but they do lend you up to about 85% of the loan to value. Um, we also benefit from, which I think you guys are as well, very low interest rates at the moment. And we also benefit from quite a competitive mortgage market where our buy-to-let providers are chasing landlords. And so the, the rates are really good. We have an adverse tax situation and we have a few bits of legislation coming in that are slowly moving the UK to a more European model. So we have to now really professionalize as landlords. To give you an, to give you an idea, uh, Brian, in the past, I bought the majority of my houses, millions and millions of pounds worth of property in my personal name. Great. And then uh, the government announced a new white paper to say that we are phasing out the cost of the interest as a tax deductible cost. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Cheers. <laughs> That's really kind of you. And so, <laughs> yeah, in the UK, almost all investors now buy in a limited company because you can still use the cost of interest, uh, whereas you can no longer use. So, so I have tens and tens and tens of thousands of pounds a month as cost of interest, which I'm now taxed on, which is really cute. But do you know what that does to you? Just makes you get better. Because then you're like, okay, I need to pay down this debt. So I've been paying down houses like penguins, you know, or dominoes, like boop, 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 what's next? Mm -hmm. um, I've been increasing rent. I've been reducing interest cost. So I'm not grateful for the change in legislation, but I like to be kept on my toes and it allows me to, or it forces me to continue to run a very good quality, profitable business. Yeah, it seems like you, you have to be a lot more lean now if you're aggressively paying down your loan. Yes. Uh, in order to um, ultimately own your properties free and clear. Is that one of your ultimate goals? Yeah. I mean, I come from, I actually come from Glasgow in Scotland, although I've got an English accent. So, you know, uh, uh, although we're not religious, I would definitely say it's good Scottish Presbyterian stock. And although I love the fact that I'm really safe and wealthy, I, I, I equate wealth with safe for me. And I love the fact that I work two hours a week and I have a very serious rental income and a superb profit. I also have this old school notion of, I want to be free. You know, I don't want to be paying the man. Um, I'm very grateful to banks, but they are a medium term route for me. They are not a long term route for me. I love paying off houses. It's great fun. Sounds like you started with, with several single family homes uh, as yes. we call them here. 
and, and then a, a one bedroom apartment. At what point did you feel comfortable enough that you were making enough money from your real estate that you could leave your corporate job? Uh, right. So this is all about time. I think in property, time, money, skills. So in my first year, while I was working corporate job, I bought three houses, you know, the kind of classic Oh, golly. And they're all, as you say, single family homes. In my second six months, still in a corporate job, I bought four more houses and I bought my first, we call them HMO, House of Multiple Occupation or Shared House. Now, mine are at the top end of the range. So typically they'll almost all have en suites. They're very, very well kept. They're very high quality. And therefore, I get top end rent and I also get top end tenants, good, good quality tenants. So it was after I bought my seventh property, which is my first HMO. And my rule is every single one of my houses now has to make over a thousand pounds a month net profit after all costs, including tax. And so it was, it was after my seventh house, which was my first HMO. So my single family homes, as you would call them in America, and we call them single lets here in the UK, they'd be making in the early days, two, three, maybe 400 pounds a month. But my HMO, a grand to a thousand pounds to a thousand five hundred. And it was at that point I went, right, let's do this full time. So I did three properties year one, four properties the, the following six months, jumped out my day job, set myself a target of 60 properties, and I only did 43. And I was really annoyed with myself, like really annoyed with myself. A couple of things. So when you say let, uh, let out a property, you're talking about renting a property, right? Yes, I am. Yes. And this HMO uh, concept, house of multiple occupancy, I think you call it. That's it. That, I'm trying to figure out what that equates to here in the United States, because it sounds like a group home. Exactly. I, it sounds to me like it is. So typically my model is five professional uh, uh, tenants, usually age about 25 to 35, maybe 32. Uh, they all have good jobs. They share a very nice kitchen, a very nice living room. But, uh, and then they all have their own bedrooms and typically I'll give them all their own bathrooms. It's like a high-end boarding house in a way. I guess without your listeners being sort of put off by that because it's quite normal here in the UK. Mm -hmm. And so for them, it's almost what you might call frictionless. So I pay for the heating, the lighting, the internet, and of course, Wi-Fi is more important than breathing to them. And so they simply move in, pay their rent and move out again. And they have no other no other thought process. I pay for the council tax and the water rates, the gas, the electricity, and the Wi-Fi. So it's quite friction, frictionless for them. They move in and they move out when they want to. And I have individual contracts with each of those people in, that, in those properties. These in the UK are very highly profitable models. Mm -hmm. And I, I am fully let at all times. And because the quality of my properties, I've always made sure they're very high. The quality of my marketing is high. I get really good quality human beings. So they're actually quite a pleasure to work with. They're decent. They're nice people. We do see that model in student housing here in the United States. I've talked to a, a number of investors on this show where they rent out student housing by the bedroom. So yes. one or two students in, a, in each bedroom. But that model tends to be a, you know, a yearly model where they're signing a 12-month lease and then a school lets out and then lets back in. They're um, turning those houses That's typically it. in July or August. But yours is a much more fluid model where people yes. are coming and going uh, and it doesn't sound like they're signing any sort of long-term contract. They're signing for us in the UK. So this might be an interesting model for you guys to look at. You know, is this something that's new? Because in the UK, this is highly profitable. So every single one of those properties I do, and I have a lot of them, makes between a thousand and a thousand five hundred pounds net profit after all costs per month, which is quite nice. Um, and we they sign in the UK. We have a minimum of a six month. A contract and then after that it moves to rolling whereby they have to give me one month's notice and I have to give them two months notice. I do also have a um, significant number of student lets as well and that is also a very nice model. I quite like the slightly older renter who knows how to live in a house. That model could work very well here and, and I'm sure it's being done in locations that I don't know about. Let, let me ask you how many people, how many bedrooms or how many people would you typically have living in a house like that? Um, five. Five is my cookie cutter. 
Mm. Now, I have a couple of houses where there's four just because of the, the, the house, but five. I, my high rent paying, high quality working professionals wouldn't generally want to live with more than five humans uh, because they're, you know, they're 28, 29, you know, and um, they definitely want their own bathroom, but they actually like the community space. They like living with other people. And it's often, I, I, I'm from a city or, or, and all of my units are within 1.9 miles of the city center. So often it's people who are coming into the city don't have community, don't have friendships that are based in that geographical location. So this is actually a welcome to them. They, they meet other people with a similar mindset um, because, uh, yes, we do all the credit checks and things, but actually my team chooses whether they place them or not. So if they like them, they'll place them. So they, they, there's, there's a ready-made group of friend, friends for them, particularly if they're moving in from out of town. Well, do you have uh, challenges with people just not getting along with each other or other types of, of uh, complaints that they might have living in that situation? Yeah, well, we have good and bad. It's quite, it's more rare than you might think if you haven't been used to this model. Um, so I put in dishwashers because I really don't want fights about washing up. <laughs> no, no interest in that. Um, th there are certain, I put in double ovens, I put in double fridges, so I don't want any fight about food storage. I don't want any fight about two people having to cook at the same time. Um, and very rarely we'll have a little oddball, a little, a little funny one who just can't socialize and get along. And so typically at that point, we, you know, either they will hand their notice in or we will um, we will hand our notice in for them and move them out. We don't keep uh, properties where there's friction from happening, but it is incredibly rare. rare. What we have had woo, is uh, tenants who get along very well. <laughs> so, so we have a house recently where they're like, we're, moved, we're, we're giving you notice. Oh, because two tenants become one tenant in a room. Woo. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. Any uh, particular stories about some of those oddball uh, tenants that, that you mentioned? Oh, okay. This is a real shame. Um, we had somebody in, as it turned out, I don't know if you use the same word, foster. So somebody who was in the care system, uh, who definitely was a um, as we call it in the UK, Jekyll and Hyde, absolutely charming, and then a real nightmare. Um, and uh, they moved in, and within two weeks, because usually the trouble happens very quickly, uh, all the other tenants were complaining about them, and it was quite clear that despite the fact we've got a six-month uh, signed contract with this lad, nobody's enjoying this situation, so it has to change. Uh, and he just was dreadful. He was homophobic, he was racist, you know, he, he exhibited a very threatening behavior. Um, but, he, and, and technically he had the right to stay there for six months and I always have to respect the law. So we just had human conversations to say, you're not enjoying being here. They're not enjoying you being here. It's not working for anybody. And actually we ended up having those conversations with his lawyer who, and also with his foster mother, because he'd clearly just come out of care, had clearly got some mental health issues and really wasn't in the right location that was gonna work for him. Um, so he uh, agreed to leave and we, we gave him back his deposit that day. So we're human, you know, but we try and, we wouldn't want to limp along with that situation for six months. And, yeah, and that, was, that, that can be pretty tw tricky. Yeah, yeah. So you try and solve it in a human way, um, and and he was part of a project where they were they were the the lawyer was one of those that was a charitable lawyer really trying to help this lad grow in his life. And I had to be quite firm with the lawyer and say, look, he's homophobic. You know, he's taken bacon and put it across his m Muslim flatmates' food. You know, this is really appalling behaviour. And I, as the landlady, will press any criminal charge I possibly can. And I'm sure your man doesn't need or want that, given that he's just come out of 
difficulty. So we did have to squeeze a little bit to say we would fully not accept this and any criminal behavior, we will, we will immediately press. But at the same time, we were like, look, we'll give him all his money back as long as he, or all his deposit back as long as he moves out quickly. So, but it's, it is very rare. With a very large portfolio, you probably get two to three bad apples a year. And part of that, Brian, is fascinating. It's the price. You know the seven Ps? Um, I wonder if I can remember them now. Price, place, positioning, promotion, people, uh, packaging, and there's one other, which I can't remember. My prices are very high. My, my packaging, sort of the, the look of the house, is very good quality. And therefore, it seems to reduce down the difficult tenants because I've got people who can afford to live there generally, and therefore those people tend to be quite committed in their professional life and also are very scared of getting any kind of court action against them if they don't pay. So it, ironically, by moving the price point up and moving the packaging up and moving the product up in terms of top quartile of what's available, I move down my problems enormously, very few. You're and pricing I'm, out your people problems. Yes, oh my goodness. Can I use that? That's fabulous. <laughs> Sticking yeah. with the keys. Um, what, what kind of laws do you have in England there? Are, do they weigh more toward protecting your residents or uh, the business owner? They are changing. I would suggest, and some of my colleagues will like throw apples at me now and go, Suze, we don't agree. I would suggest that until recently, they were relatively, and I say relatively, strong for the landlord. Yes, yes, you will have some difficulties. If somebody refuses to move out, you have to take them to court. It can take a long time. But I would suggest that in the past, in the UK, we had enough legal um, leverage to be able to broadly protect our assets. What is happening, it's political. You know, P P PESL, political, economic, social, legal, technical, and environmental. I do that kind of scanning of my business every three months. What is happening is in the UK, as house prices go up, because we're a little island, um, we're boundaried and they're not building enough property. So my, my, my capital growth is tremendous. So as house prices go up, uh, people are, um, and as the millennial generation comes through and chooses to invest in life experiences rather than saving money, so they want the beautiful house straight away. They, they don't want to start with a really tiny fixer upper. So they delay the uh, buying of houses for themselves uh, for a number of different reasons, a cultural reason as well as a price point reason, then the number of tenants increases, which again, guess what, increases my price and my rent because we're a small island and there are, there are not many houses compared to the people that need them. And therefore, the age of the voter being a tenant has just started. In the past in the UK, voters broadly speaking were homeowners as a result of voters being tenants politicians have finally woken up and are starting to introduce laws that i would suggest are more european which really start to protect the tenant so i'm so there are a number of laws a number of legislation changes coming in have come in and will come in that are much more on the tenant side so what does that mean we've got to professionalize Professionalized. I've, I've, so what does that mean, professionalized? Because, uh, you know, I host this podcast on behalf of the Rental Property Owners Association, yes. which, uh, you know, is, is, it's a nonprofit that helps inform, educate, and protect the yes. landlords and rental property owners' rights. Yes. And one of our, our big uh, pushes is on the legislative side to help prevent just the type of legislation that, that you're talking about that could yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a, a wow. number of lobbying organizations, but... I, I, they're doing a fine job, but they are trying to hold back the tide and the tide being as people don't buy houses and remain tenants well into their voting years, the politicians are starting to listen and therefore they're starting to give them further and further security. So they've just taken away most but not all of our uh, rights to evict. Um, and they are, I suspect in the long run, we'll have rent caps and we'll have much, much stronger tenancies on the tenant side. So what am I doing about it? First off, my choice of tenant. So if we go back to the seven Ps, of which I could only remember six, I'm making sure my product is very high quality at all times. I mean, I would do that anyway. I, I want to have good quality homes for people to live in. But as a result, 
I'm top quartile, so I get the pick of the tenants because my properties are definitely in the top 10% of properties available out there. So they go really fast. As a result, I get the pick of the tenants. So I choose good quality people with good credit rating, good attitudes, and we have very rare, do we have internal problems with tenants? We do sometimes, but very rare. Um, and as a result, I'm also, because I'm expecting longer term uh, rents to come in and rent caps, I want to make sure my prices are high from the beginning. So if they do cap me, I'm already a high priced and I don't want, so for example, they brought in this um, reduced ability to evict last June and ahead of last June, we looked at my portfolio with my team and we identified maybe four or five people who were niggly. Um, they were perfectly okay human beings, but they were just very difficult to work with. And we thought, Do you know what? We don't need to house you. This is a commercial operation. And if you're going to be difficult and hard work, we would prefer for you to no longer be in this portfolio and we're going to bring in a better quality uh, tenant. So we basically replaced a poor quality client with a better quality client. And it was all about attitude, because if we're going to have a reduced ability to evict, we don't want somebody who's got a stinky attitude. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. The unintended consequences of that type of uh, push yeah. for legislation to protect the, the tenants uh, can sometimes force owners uh, like like you yourself yeah. into getting you know preemptively getting rid of some of the tenants that, that you decide you no longer want. That's exactly what happened. And yeah, and we're seeing the same push for rent control uh, in different areas that will have the same unintended consequences that you just yes. spoke of. Yes, it will. And the other, um, the other part that I don't do, which probably is quite different for you guys, is I believe that we have a greater, uh, a more, I don't know what the, quite the word would be, a more inclusive or, or a broader social security service. So in the UK, that's called housing benefit, whereby somebody's a, a, a little bit poorer and is unable to necessarily afford rent on their own. So the government comes in and pays housing benefit. So they wouldn't be paying the rent themselves or they may be part paying the rent themselves and getting social security to pay the balance of the rent. Now, my understanding is that those types of tenants, over 50% of them are in arrears from my reading, from my broad reading around the industry magazines. And I'm afraid to say, as much as I'd love to help people, I will not take a tenant of that type because I've got no need for anybody who's going to be in arrears. So I do treat it as a business, which then I think it's a real shame, but then cuts out certain segments of our population because they would not be treating it as a business the way I would. And uh, I still got to pay my mortgages. Absolutely. It is a business and you, you have your expenses that need to be met. Um, I want to I want to talk about the business side of it because you've raised millions of pounds to put toward buying buying real estate, and you talk about one one of your specialties is deal packaging as well yes. as raising cash. And I'd like to talk about both of those. Um, starting with deal packaging, what does that mean to you, and how have you employed it? Oh, so I love deals. Well, well, I like everything about property, to be quite honest. With you. I even love the spreadsheets. But deal packaging is basically where you find a property. You uh, you found it discounted and you sell it on to an investor. So say say you were like, Suze, I really want to invest in Bristol. All right, Brian, great. Um, and this is my budget. I will go and find, and I've got a typical, I will go and find a deal. Uh, uh, so for example, I, t I actually ended up buying this one, but I bought it, I got it, I got it sale agreed for 203,000 pounds. The refurb was 41,000, but I knew at the time once it was done up, it was worth 330,000. So just to repeat those figures, bought for 203, refurb 41, worth 330 there and then. So I, I almost explain this in a simpler way. If it's worth 100, I'll be buying it for 75. And, there are st and while somebody might be shaking their head going, you can't do this, you can. This is basically, I call this buying houses wholesale. So uh, you can buy houses wholesale from auctions, and in the England or in Britain, you can buy them pre the auction, during the auction, or after the auction if it's failed to sell. And typically, for every four houses I try and buy, I buy one. And one time we tried to buy 30 houses from an auction, and we got seven. So that's more or less the same maths, isn't it? 
Mm -hmm. uh, and we were bidding on 30. You also, for us, we buy them from estate agents. And typically for every 100 in houses or 100 phone calls I make, I will view 25 properties, offer on 21 properties and buy one. So those are my maths. 100, 100 phone calls gets me one house through estate agents. And I attempt to buy four houses in order to buy one at auction. And that has to be discounted. And that's why we did 45 million quid's worth of property sourced for 30 million quid before refurb. And we did that in four and a half years, 217 properties. So it can be done. This is very similar to wholesaling. Are you then selling to, a, to another buyer before taking possession of the property? Or are you taking possession of it and, and doing the rehab yourself? Great question. No, um, there are a number of things you can do, but pure deal packaging. So again, let's just say it was you and I, and you're like, Susanna, I've come all over all funny and I want to invest in Bristol, England. Okay, <laughs> great. I can help you. Um, then what I would be doing is uh, finding that property. So say the £203,000 property that I know because I've done 45 pieces of research that it's going to be revaluing about 330 because I, I would never buy something unless I've done the research. And then I would be charging you a 5% fee. So... For two, if I found a house at 203,000, I would charge you just over 10 grand, 10,150 pounds. And you would quite gladly pay me just over 10 grand for a house at 203. You've got to spend 41 grand um, and it will be worth 330 because you're still going to make a packet. So that's how I basically started in property was finding discounted deals packaging them up. When I say packaging them up, um, I would get the convincing. I always had a team of three lawyers. And my, again, Brian, let's just say it was you and I, you would be then working with one of my lawyers under English law, they would become your lawyer. So it's all above board, but I would never allow you to use your lawyer, not because there's anything dodgy, but purely my experience over the time showed me that and no offense meant Brian at all, but if you were to use your lawyer, the chances are your lawyer doesn't realize how fast we have to go to make these deals happen. Whereas my panel of lawyers do because they've worked with me before. So they would do the client care pack. You would, you would then sign up with one of these lawyers who under the law was now your lawyer, not mine. They just were my panel the way that mortgage companies have a panel of solicitors. So we would get it bought in your name. You would own it. And on the day of purchase, you would pay me my fee. So what would I do that 10 grand? I put it into another property. I put it into a refurb, I put it into a deposit and that's what we did. So deal packaging was finding wholesale properties, charging 5% of the purchase price and making sure they come through to the point of purchase. You buy it and you pay me my fee. That, that's very similar in concept to wholesaling here in the United States, but there's some yeah. key differences. You're charging a flat fee of 5%. Yeah, and wholesaling here, rather than charge a flat fee, most wholesalers will will charge uh, sell it for a price well above what they're getting it for, and yes. then um, keep the difference. But that does mean that they need to have some cash in the first place. Not necessarily, because if they if they assign the contract, ah, love you can assign it for the difference. Um, in some places, you can do a, what's called a double close, where they, they yes. you're right, they would need to have some cash on hand, but they can yeah. take out a hard money loan for a couple of days. Um, the, other, the other big difference, uh, which sounds very helpful for you, is that you can use the same lawyer. You can insist that they use your legal team. Yes. Um, whereas here, you sometimes have two, two different lawyers who, you're right, aren't on the same page. And uh, one who's new to the process might slow things down sometimes kill the deal <laughs> so oh lawyers do don't they they absolutely do kill deals all the time <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 that's what they're trained to do yeah uh, <laughs> we have we have the signable contracts but they're very rare and they're not they're not culturally normal so um, packaging was the first way of doing it the second way to get more value out of it speaking plainly for myself was uh, as I noticed all these millions of pounds that I was sort of handing over to other people and listen I was super grateful for the money because because the money allowed me to buy my own houses. I don't regret any of it, but I also kind of went, hang on, <laughs> um, you're getting that and I'm getting this. Um, hmm, you know, um, so then what I would do, again, if you don't mind, if we, if we assumed it was you and I, we, I would then joint venture. 
So then I would be like, okay, I'm going to release X amount of package deals, wholesale deals, and get paid a fee. And I'm going to do Y amount of joint ventures, which would be, uh, let's say you were the money guy, Brian, I found this amazing deal. It's going to, it's worth, I'm buying it for another case study. I'm buying it for 112. It's going to be a 20 grand refurb. And we expect to sell it about 170. Are you in? And you would do no work at all. You wouldn't need to do anything but fund it. Uh, and then we, I would do all the work and then I would get it sold and then we'd split the profit 50-50. So I then moved to joint ventures as well. Yeah, that, and that, that concept works here as well. Although there's, there's some, uh, it is coming under attack in, in some, some ways, but uh, the joint venture where someone puts up 100% of the money and yeah. then uh, someone does 100% of the work and they split the profit 50-50. That, you see that all the time. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. And it, it does sound then like part of your strategy is not just the, the, um, the deal packaging slash wholesaling, but you're taking that profit and then buying your own properties that you're going to do a buy and hold with. Absolutely. Because that's the holy grail, isn't it? Um, some great assets that bring you in the income uh, that is un not tied to your day-to-day -day work rate. And are you folk when you in your buy and hold strategy? Are you focusing solely on the HMOs? The um, which no remind me what that the hospital. What was what is house it? of multiple occupation? They got to be licensed. You have got to pay a bit of tax on them. You got you know those room standard sizes. But I don't mind regulation because these are somebody's children. You know somebody somebody loves these kids to bits, isn't it, mum and dad? And I want to make sure that. I have done everything I possibly can to make sure they're safe. So I'm I'm cool with regulation because generally it's there to make sure that I am a high quality landlord and I'm fine with that. Um, no, so I have a whole bunch of multi-lets or HMOs, house of multiple occupation, whereby you've got five bathrooms, five bedrooms, one living room, one kitchen. And then I've got a whole bunch of single lets. Uh, generally, I pay those off quite quickly because I now have a rule. Every single one of my houses has to make a thousand pound net or I won't bother doing it. You know, ha, just toss my hair. Um, I'm now splitting houses into flats because I think one of the things you picked up on is that multi-let, that HMO model, it's great, but it's a rotating amount of tenants moving in and out. So to give you an idea, in 2019, in the first six months in my portfolio, my team booked 3,000 viewings. <laughs> that, oh, yeah. that's a lot of work. That's what I said too. And of course, I'm paying for that work. Um, I do I do planning permission, I do land, um, I do house builds, and I do some Airbnb as well. But I'm primarily now on the second stage of my portfolio, paying off houses and looking to improve my efficiencies through automation, through tech, and through making them more and more efficient. So for me, an HMO, a high cash strategy with a fair amount of work is a stage one, which I'm very grateful for, but I'm slowly turning those houses into apartments or student lets because that's more efficient in the long run. Gotcha. Okay. And then um, you're also an expert in raising cash. And, and is that uh, through the, you're raising money from investors to JV with them, or are you also pooling money together from multiple investors to buy larger deals? Both, actually, both. And interestingly, larger deals, um, I'm, I like a cookie cutter. Once I got a model, I want to I want to go in fast, stamp it out again and again, and get really really good at it. So you know that kind of natural progression where people buy an apartment, then a house, then a block of flats, and then they start building fifteen houses. I don't want to do that. Why? Because I've seen too many people stretch themselves constantly, often with a big chest, and you know, and then they go bust. And I have no interest in going bust. I work really hard for this and I, I like the security in the asset and the passive income. So I like building houses, but I don't ever want to go to, you know, 10 million pound developments because it's just like, what's life for? We're only here for one, you know, life is short. I, I have enough property for the rest of my life. I am still acquiring, I'm doing six developments this year, which for me is really small, but life is short. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying life. So so uh, I did joint ventures, yes, but I also raised a lot of cash on a loan basis. And oh my God, I was paying at the beginning like a crazy fool. I was paying 12% interest. Um, and now all my investors are paid out, but I got it down to 2% at the end. And I raised millions of pounds in loans as well, bought houses, discounted, 
did them up, refinanced them, paid the investors back. In a nutshell, could you just tell us what is your secret to raising all that money? Uh, being open. Uh, okay. Being genuinely honest, um, being open, uh, showing everybody everything. What frightened the living daylights out of me was out of all my investors, and I work with hundreds, two people did proper due diligence on me. Isn't that scary? Mm. I mean, so what I did was reverse engineer it. I just decided I'm going to give you all the due diligence you should be doing. So, so I didn't, I was really open. Like when I was still working in the day job, I raised 600 grand and that allowed me to buy a portfolio. So I would show them my salary. I'd show them my mortgage statements. I'd show them in the early days, I showed them my portfolio. Now, Frank, well, I don't raise money anymore. I've paid it all back. But you know, when I was raising money, I'd show everybody my portfolio. I'd show them the RICS valuations. That's the severe valuations, the professional guys. Um, I'd show them the mortgage statements. I'd show them the equity. I'd show them the rent. I'd show them my bank statements there's not much there's nothing to be hidden i'd then tell them ironically everything i did wrong because i needed them to realize that occasionally something might go wrong i'd then tell them i'm going to repay your money with this plan a which would be refinance plan b is i'm running three buy to sells alongside which should repay your money in case something goes wrong with the refinance plan c is i'm running x amount of package deals which should repay your money if the buy to sells don't work and the refinancing doesn't work and plan d is a sell the property which should do you see what i mean so i was like i got four plans to pay you back i'm going to tell you now twice i paid people back late i have never been more embarrassed but it will happen if you raise a lot of money. And I just communicated with them. I was so ashamed, but it was, in each of those circumstances, I had four different plans to pay back one pot of money and each of them failed, you know, one after, not failed, but, but didn't come to fruition in time. So I would call it failed in time. So when you say you paid them late, how late were you paying them? Oh, like one guy was six weeks and I was mortified and somebody else was about four weeks. That's oh. awful. <laughs> Well, in my opinion, that's awful. Mm. So, so, so number one, do you see really open? Number two, tell them everything that could go wrong, ironically. Number three, uh, um, you can tell was really, 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 really paranoid about paying people back because you can tell that from what I'm telling you. And then I think number four, I just know that there are, there's the art and the science of raising finance. So I know that the, the maths, the science, five to nine touch points before somebody will trust you. So I simply made sure I had five to nine conversations, coffees, lunches with people um, before they would agree to invest in me. So I did it as fast as possible. Wow. And then obviously paperwork, you know, proper legal documentation, all signed, all above the law, always. Yeah, and it's obviously worked out very well for you. Um, I appreciate the the transparency that you talk about. I mean, I, I, I'm in the same camp where I believe, you know, it's important to share the ups and downs, the pitfalls, maybe some of your failures and yes. uh, your track record so that yes. people know exactly who they're investing with. Yeah. And, and I think uh, there were two types of investors, mainly if somebody's listening, thinking I might want to find somebody to invest in me, I found there are generally two types of investors. So you can kind of categorize it. One is business owners who've done extremely well for themselves, maybe have four million pounds plus in the bank. So typically they've either bought a business or built a business and sold it, or they've done a management buyout and then sold it. So typically, but not always, they're in their late forties to early sixties and they've got you know millions of pounds of cash because they have been an entrepreneur and then they've sold it. They're brilliant investors because like you and I, Brian, they know things can go wrong and they've probably had things go wrong as well as right. The second type of investor that's going to work with you is somebody that's done extremely well in corporate life and is extremely well paid and therefore has got an accumulation of savings, but no time. Now they're a little bit, some of them are completely lovely, but generally they're a little bit harder work because their pot is smaller. So they've got more to lose, if you see what I mean. Um, and they also, they've grown up in corporate life where, you know, the politics mean, I guess you try and blame somebody else if it goes wrong, rather than taking it on the chin. So for them, they're less used to business failure as well as business success. But nonetheless, they're still going to make an important part of your fundraising campaign.
Yeah. I, in both categories, those are high net worth investors who Agreed. are, I, I'd imagine are investing only money that they could afford to lose if things were to go completely bad. Uh, absolutely. And it sounds like you guys have some legislation, as do we, um, which protects people who would not have the savvy to invest money that could potentially be lost. We've got legislation we need to comply with as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of rules and regulations uh, that we have to have to follow when when working with investors to separate those who are sophisticated or accredited high net worth versus those who who um you know the, the sec security and exchange commission would be concerned might be taken advantage of so exactly. so we have to be very careful um so you, you you talk you mentioned um you know if anyone's listening who who would would even consider investing with you uh here's what they need to know what else do we need to know about you as far as contacting you um, I know you've got a couple, you've got some other things going on that you wanted to share with us. So these days, my life is simplified. You know that crazy run up the hill as you're buying the assets? Well, now they're largely bought, although I'm still buying more. Oh, and I'm currently renovating a grade two star listed chapel. It, can I just tell you guys, and then I will tell contact details. So it's a chapel that was built in the 14th century. Woo and I have I have the mayor of Bristol and his wife. He died in 1407. She died in 1411. And they're buried in my chapel. And it's the most central chapel in Bristol. And I'm currently renovating that because it's no longer used for religious purposes into a really beautiful home, which is quite good fun. So that's my current fun project. Um, but well, I hope you're getting lots of video. Tons. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's to die for. It's, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. I think, you know, I do have two graves in there and they're protected under historic rules. So I've got to keep those graves. Wow. Um, but, so these days I don't deal package and I don't borrow money because I'm, the portfolio is built. And I love to share the information because, you know, if I could do it from a kitchen table startup, then frankly, anybody could do it. So I got a YouTube channel. It's, it's the good property company, Susanna Cole. And we publish videos every day and we've got well over a million views. So if you want some English uh, accents instead of American accent, go and have a look over there. And then we have our website. I produce what I hope to be very high quality education material for people, packs, video, um, workshops, masterclasses. I give people all the sample legal docs, you know, stuff that cost me two and a half grand. I have to call it sample because I'm not a lawyer, but... Basically, it's what cost me two and a half grand. I'll give it to people for like 20 quid or something. And I've got all of that on my website, which is thegoodpropertycompany.co.uk. And then obviously all the usual socials, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn and everything. We like, I like sharing the fact that property can work. I definitely appreciate you sharing with us today. It's been really fascinating learning about the differences of investing in the UK versus here in the United States. And just hearing about the the different types of deals you've put together and what HMOs are, I mean, that's what a great concept that uh, I think could help us here in the United States if it's not already being done. And Susanna, it's, I've really enjoyed this conversation. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you too, Brian. It's been an absolute pleasure. You're my very first international podcast, so it's been a delight. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group, and you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more more at greenpropertymgt.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review.